Oh my gosh, wow, this is a big room. <laughs> so they told me this was gonna be a big room, but I didn't really understand how big, so it's great to see you all, wow. Um, so I wanna preface this talk that I prepared for you by apologizing in advance for this giant set of notes that I'm gonna be looking at. Um, I have really, really terrible stage fright, which I guess might come as a surprise to some people. Um, it gives me the worst possible memory, so if I don't have all this in front of me, I'm pretty much gonna be like standing up here and reciting Seinfeld quotes, um, <laughs> rather than telling you about what I've learned the last two years. Also, if I do like off, go off uh, my notes and I start saying some things that might sound a little familiar and comedic, like let me know, because it's probably Seinfeld and not my talk. Um, <laughs> that said, it's really difficult for me to believe that two years have passed since I wrote my now infamous blog post about my experiences as a software engineer at Uber. So much has happened in those two years that it now feels as if we live in a very, very different world. Silicon Valley is a very different place. <clears throat> Our country is a really different place, and the world is very different than it was two years ago. And I have to admit that in those two years, I have changed just as much as Silicon Valley and the world, if not more. I've grown and I've learned some really important and as far as I'm concerned, life-changing lessons along the way. My goal today is to share a few of these lessons with you. And I haven't really said very much in the two years that have passed. Um, in fact, I tried really hard to say as little as possible for a few reasons. I had to get out of the way of my story. I had to let the story run its course in the news. I had to wait till all the investigations concluded and the results became public and wait until everything died down. And you know, aside from the occasional tweet and a very small number of interviews, I said almost nothing, really until today. There were many things I wanted to say in that time. Um, instead of saying those things in the moment, I wrote it all down and I put it into a book. Everything I desperately wanted to share with the world, instead of saying it out loud, I wrote it down. Every time someone, whether a friend or a reporter or a lawyer or a private investigator, asked me a question, I went and I wrote down the answer and saved it for the book and for today. Every time I heard some nasty, awful, or even hilarious rumor, and believe me, there are some really hilarious rumors um, about myself, <laughs> I addressed it in the book. Um, every time I'd stop to think what had happened and how it had all happened and try to understand why it happened, I couldn't say anything, so I saved it. Well, as fate would have it, I sent the draft of that book to my editor two weeks ago, and so here I am on stage in front of all of you, and I'm ready to talk about the last two years. Now, I've never given this talk before. Um, you're the first, the very first people to hear any of the things that I have to say today. One of the great unforeseen benefits of not talking to anybody about this stuff for two years is that I had quite a bit of time to think about it. I got to sit back and watch as the world slowly changed, as the map of the world was lit up by small sparks, the smallest fires that were started by brave men and women all over the world, and watched as those sparks grew into all-consuming flames. I got to watch as things went right and good changes came about and saw just as many things go wrong. I was able to slowly and carefully attempt to wrap my head around what had happened, both in my life and in the world. And none of it really made sense from this short-sighted short point of view, that my blog post was just a lucky accident, that it was just a singular event, that it was just a one-time thing that just so happened to work. So I had to dig a lot deeper into my own life, into the forces that changed and shaped my, the way that I made decisions. And I had to go very far back into my own past and figure out how I'd gotten where I am today. So let's talk about what happened, um, what happened before Uber, what happened after Uber. Uh, we can't really start with today because the present rarely makes any sense without the detailed context of the past. And we have a very long way to go, but life is good today. The world is getting better every day, even though at times it really doesn't feel like it is. But if you look where we came from, if you look at where the world was two years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, you can see that the world is getting to be a much, much better place for women, for example, to live than it was 50 years ago. So before I tell you about what happened after the blog post, I wanna go back in time and tell you a little bit about myself. Because it'll come up 
um, later in some of the lessons that I'm going to share with you. And I don't want to go just back to that fateful day in February when I decided that I was going to sit at my computer and share my story with the world. Um, not just back to my time at Uber, uh, not even back to my first day at Uber or my first day in Silicon Valley. Um, I want to go back all the way to when I was a little girl. Um, you see, <laughs> if you had met me when I was just a little kid, you never would have predicted that I'd be on this stage today. I grew up in a very poor town in rural Arizona. I was one of seven kids, daughter of a preacher, homeschooled with no formal education. I didn't know where life was going to take me, and neither did anyone else. And I didn't learn all the same things that my peers were learning in public school. I didn't go to recess. I didn't, you know, have many friends my age. I didn't play any school sports. But I learned something in those years that ultimately brought me to this stage. And that thing is resilience. And when I was very, very young, my late father, who passed when I was a teenager, said to me that every challenge in our life was God's way of testing us to see if we were ready for what was going to come next. And throughout the years of my life, I've certainly had my share of these challenges. And when I look back, it always seems like the last challenge was preparing me for the exact thing that led ahead. When I found myself as an entry-level engineer at, um, at Uber, I'd already been through the fire. I'd already been tested so many times. I'd failed many of those tests, more than I'd like to admit to you today. I made many, many mistakes. But I learned enough in the process that by the time I was at Uber, the stakes were high, the situation was dire, and I was ready. Speaking of the situation, it's worth recounting, because it has been 10 years. And I know that I can barely remember anything that I read two years ago. So let me go back and just refresh our collective memory. I joined Uber as a software engineer in 2015. I'd graduated from college a year before, had worked at two small startups in Silicon Valley before working at Uber. The Silicon Valley I worked at back in those days was not the Silicon Valley we see today, which is something that's kind of hard to remember. Uh, at the time, it was painted as a place of extreme power and influence over the rest of the country, if not the entire world. Uber was the big company at the time. It still is to some extent, but it's really hard now to understand, you know, with everything that's been in the news about Uber in the last two years, to understand the extent to which many people idolized and worshipped the transportation giant at the time. It's easy to forget two years after that blog post, two years after the flurry of investigations and news articles and weekly, sometimes daily scandals, what the, like, what the world was like when I worked at Uber, what Uber was like when I worked at Uber. I came to Silicon Valley straight out of college. I'm going to have a little sip of water here. And I'd been told a lot of stories about the place before I arrived. I was told it was the place to be if you wanted to work on really, really hard problems that it was the place to be if you wanted to work quickly, if you wanted to innovate and work with the most intense and revolutionary and amazingly difficult technologies, that it was the place where hard work and critical thinking, curiosity and grit were rewarded and embraced. While I was still in college, I interviewed with some of the biggest companies. Um, and the prospects weren't too exciting for a big company, uh, at, at the big companies for a junior engineer who wanted to work on hard problems. So I decided to go to small startups instead. But small startups had problems of their own. And so I went to Uber, the place that everybody said was a big company with a startup mentality. When I arrived, when Silicon Valley companies like Uber and Facebook were at the height of their power, I expected it to really be something to behold. But the most accurate analogy isn't that Silicon Valley was like Rome at the height of its power, which is as how some people explained it to me, um, but that it was Rome at the height of its decadence and decay. Some of the largest, hottest companies, the ones that now come to mind when we think of the excesses of Silicon Valley, were filled with extravagance, luxury, and disregard for law and morality. Uber was one of those companies at the time. And I need to pause here and make something absolutely clear. Um, just as many of the Silicon Valley companies were not all powerful or incredibly influential, they were not all immoral or running around with blatant disregard for the law. I think one of the most dangerous myths that I've seen emerge over the last few years is that most or all tech, com tech companies or Silicon Valley companies more broadly are as bad as the worst companies or as bad as Uber. It's not true. It's just absolutely not true. The vast majority of tech companies are not lavish, law-breaking, privacy-violating monsters. Many of them are good companies run by good people who are working hard to build something of lasting value, something of worth. To look at every startup founder and judge them as if they were an Elizabeth Holmes just waiting to be found out is short-sighted. 
To look at every tech company and judge it if they were just an Uber waiting for an employee to write a blog post is absurd. The worst of the bunch do not represent the whole of Silicon Valley or the, of technology companies across the world. With that disclaimer in mind, though, the unfortunate truth is that there was a handful of companies, the Ubers and the other ones that we all know about, whose names I don't need to mention, and that were held up as a definition of what success looked like in Silicon Valley. A couple of rotten apples spoiled the bunch. And while it was pretty on the outside with those high valuations, the unbelievable sums of money and revenue their founders on the covers of magazines was that inside it was falling apart, rotting, and decaying. That was the Silicon Valley that I experienced at Uber. I was sexually harassed by my manager on my very first day on his team. When I reported it to Uber's human resources department, they put the penalty onto me instead of onto my manager. They took me off his team and put me on another team. Now, I wasn't allowed to, I wasn't about to let Uber's human resources issues or the problems I had with one manager ruin my career or my job. So I worked my butt off, and I found ways to love my job and love my work. I had truly amazing coworkers who taught me a great deal about engineering, about life, about friendship, who I am incredibly grateful for. And some of these coworkers told me, as I got to know them, that they'd experienced similar treatment from their managers, in some cases from the very same manager who had harassed me. So we all got together, and we took the issue to Uber's HR representatives, who still refused to acknowledge the problem. And over the next few months, as that very, very strange year at Uber wore on, things only got worse. The culture was incredibly aggressive and destructive and cruel. Managers yelled at their employees and told them they weren't real engineers. My managers told me this quite often. Not all of the teams were bad, and there were some teams that were very good, that had very good cultures. So when I tried to join one of these teams, my manager blocked my transfer. I'd had a very good performance review before my transfer was blocked one that was supposed to allow me to transfer to another team, but the company protocol wasn't followed. It was completely ignored. Later, when I tried to transfer again, after my next performance review, my performance review was retroactively, retroactively changed so that I didn't qualify for this transfer to another team. And after all, that this ha all of this happened, I learned that my managers were most likely keeping me from transferring because other managers were getting in trouble for losing their female engineers. And of course, the story that sticks out among all the absurd stories uh, is about the leather jackets. And here I'm going to read from my blog post because I think that the story is worth telling in full. Um, <laughs> Earlier in the year, the organization had promised leather jackets for everyone in the company and had taken all of our sizes. We all tried them on and found our sizes and placed our orders. One day, all of the women, there were, I believe, six of us left in that specific engineering organization, received an email saying that no leather jackets were being ordered for the women because there were not enough women to justify placing an order. I replied and said, OK, <laughs> I'm sure Uber, Uber SRE, the Site Reliability Engineering Organization, can find room in their budget to buy leather jackets for the six women if they could afford to buy them for over 120 men. The engineering director replied back and said, well, if we women really wanted equality, then we should realize we were getting equality by not getting the leather jackets. He said that because there were so many men, they had gotten a significant discount on the men's jackets, but not on the women's jackets. And it wouldn't be equal or fair to give the women leather jackets that didn't get this discount, that cost a few dollars more than the men's jackets. We were told that if we wanted leather jackets, we women needed to find a jackets that were the same price as the bulk order price of the men's jackets. Well, I wasn't going to have this. <laughs> this is kind of a, just completely absurd. Uh, so I reported this to HR, and I was told that I was the problem, not Uber. The HR representative sat across from me, and she said, I've looked at all of the complaints that you've made over the time you've been here, and I've noticed that there's one unifying factor. And I was like, what? She said, it's you. <laughs> You're the problem. So that's how that meeting went. Um, <laughs> then my managers discovered I had reported this to Human Resources. So one of my managers uh, sat me down in a meeting and told me that if I ever reported anything to HR again, I would be fired. Well, I didn't last much longer at that company, as you can imagine. Uh, not that I was fired. I left before I <laughs> let them have the opportunity to do that. 
And on my last day at Uber, I calculated the percentage of women who were still in my organization. Now, when I first got there, one of the things that they'd said to really sell me on joining was, well, this part of our engineering organization, uh, it's 25% women. And I was like, holy cow, I've never heard that before. Like, I'd heard 6%, 9%, 15%. But 25%, and there were a lot of women when I joined. Um, but on my last day, when I calculated how many women were still there, out of over 150 engineers on the site reliability engineering team, only 3% of them were women. The issues that I saw and experienced at Uber were not, not unique. Uh, many of my coworkers at Uber experienced similar and sometimes far worse treatment. A lot of people that I met after I shared my story who had been engineers at other companies had ex experienced things just as bad, if not far worse. Many people, high-ranking people in the company, were aware of all the problems, and they refused to do anything. And it was a terrible shame because many of the people that I worked with were incredibly good at their jobs. They were brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and they loved their jobs, and they wanted to be the very best versions of themselves that they could be. I was really lucky to work with these people, and I, I also really loved the work that I was doing. It was hard. It was very technically challenging, and it got my mind working in all kinds of ways that I loved. And we kept trying to make Uber good. We kept trying to change it from the inside, trying to make, you know, we thought, well, if we can just put our heads down and try to make this company the best company that we can make it, if we be the best people that we can be, then maybe it'll start to get better. But it was like trying to paint a house that had a rotting foundation, a broken foundation, hoping that a new cone of paint would just magically fix everything. And everything was just rotting. The, the, the structure of the house was just completely rotten. And I think it was rotten from the start. Um, when I look back, I see that you know it was a company that was built and designed to break things. It was built to break regulations. It was built to break laws. It was built to disrupt and to destroy, not to create something new or take something that already existed and make it better. And it was one of the more disturbing things that we all saw in Uber, that it was hell-bent on pushing and breaking its way into the world. That the, and the story that could have been told, the company that it could have been from the beginning, the one that was, you know, could have been making things better or creating something new, bringing something good to the world, it didn't have a chance to exist. It was like being part of a machine that could only destroy. And it not only destroyed you know, some laws and regulations, it destroyed a lot of people. And it almost destroyed me. It tore us apart, and it broke us down, and it made us feel like we were going crazy, like we weren't who we knew we were. It drove some of my colleagues to very desperate places, and one of my colleagues tragically took his own life. It was a very, very different time then. It was a time when things like this were kept in the dark and were very secret. And I remember, before I even joined Uber, and I tried to make friends with other women in the industry, that there was this thing that everyone talked about this so-called whisper network in the tech industry, which was made up of women who worked in various jobs throughout Silicon Valley, who would all share stories of the bad people and the bad companies and the bad bosses. And every time I heard about this network, I'd ask, well, who's in it and why isn't this information public? And it took me a long time to learn, and I finally learned it when I was at Uber, that this information wasn't public because it was closely guarded, very vulnerable information that the women in these groups understandably didn't feel comfortable sharing with others. But unfortunately, the people who needed this information the most were not the people who had access to it. To be part of this group was to be someone interesting or important or well-known in the tech world, which the majority of young women like myself who were just coming into the industry and trying to survive, we weren't part of that group. My coworkers at Uber who were mistreated, junior engineers, Latina engineers, black engineers, and not just women, but many men also, they didn't know what they were signing up for when they joined Uber because they didn't have access to any of that information. And nobody really talked openly about sexual harassment. Nobody talked about the blatant discrimination. Nobody talked about the cost. Nobody talked about the drinking culture that was such a huge part of the Silicon Valley ex experience. And this is something that people still, I don't think, talk about. What people did talk about 
was that being sexually harassed and reporting it or even talking about it with your coworkers or friends would be the end of your career. I can't even begin to remember all of the dozens of conversations I had with people in Silicon Valley when I was at Uber, where I told them what was going on with me and some of my coworkers, and I was told that I could never talk about it unless I wanted to say goodbye to my career forever. They say, oh, no one would hire you. Everyone would know that you were just someone who, who would go tattle on you know, the harassment and discrimination to managers. You'd never be promoted. You'd be the first one to go when it was a performance review cycle. And so I was, I was very scared, as were many people. But there were some very brave women who did stand up and talk long before it was OK to talk about what had happened to them. They demanded to be treated better, and the, wor the world wasn't ready for them. And the world wasn't ready for me either when I was an engineer at Uber. The world wasn't ready until the beginning of 2017 when Trump had just been elected and political, racial, and gender tensions were incredibly high. It seemed like for the very first time in a long time, the world was actually ready to reckon with some of the issues that had been swept under the rug. And one of those issues was the appalling treatment of women, not only in Silicon Valley companies like Uber, but within Hollywood, media, Congress, and more. And when you're part of a movement, when you're standing at the very beginning of it, like I was, you really have no way of knowing that you are part of something. It was, for me, just an act of self-preservation to, to stand up and tell the world what had happened. It was an act of stepping up to the plate and saying, I'm going to share what's happened to me. I'm going to share it without telling anyone else's story but my own. And I'm just going to put it out into the world. And I'm going to face whatever the consequences. I don't care if I never get to work in engineering again. Why would I want to work in an industry if I would be treated like this there? It didn't make any sense to me. I was willing to throw it all away because I had nothing left to lose at that point. And I was very scared for my friends who are still there. I was scared what might happen to them. And there's nothing like terror to push someone into realizing that they have to do what's right, no matter what the consequences. The world was ready. The world was changing. But I didn't know any of that. I had no idea what was going on. I was in my own head. <laughs> and all I knew that I, was that I had to do what was right, and that this was what was right. And I was terrified out of my mind. And so that's where I was almost two years ago today when I sat down at my laptop and I wrote, reflecting on one very, very strange year at Uber. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You're all very kind. I haven't broken into any Seinfeld quotes yet, so I think we're good. <laughs> so we all know what happened next, right? The world was on fire. There were so many other women and men who all felt the call at the same time. There were so many brave individuals who stood up and put their lives and careers and dreams on the line and told their stories to the world. And this is where I think there's an extremely important point to be made one that should be noticed and should never, ever be forgotten. The world completely changed. And for the most part, and I'll come back to this in a minute, it completely changed for the better. And it changed because a group of people all over the world decided to take their story back. They decided to stand up and say, I'm not going to let someone in a position of power make me the victim of my own life. I'm going to take my story back. I am the hero in my own story, in my own life. And they did it just by sharing what had happened with, to them. They did it just by sharing their stories. And there is nothing in heaven or on earth that is more powerful than someone sharing their story. There is nothing that will change the world more easily and stir people's hearts than someone standing up, sharing what happened to them, and being vulnerable, because it's so terrifying to tell people what had happened. It's embarrassing. It's so embarrassing to stand up, even today, when I say, like, I was sexually harassed. I feel this, like, flutter in my stomach. I'm like, oh, God, that's so crappy that that happened to me. And it's so embarrassing to tell that to people. But it wasn't just one story. It wasn't my, just my story. It wasn't the story that followed. It was a chorus of voices, all who stood up and shared what happened to them. And they changed the world. We changed the world. And everyone who sat there and looked at the stories and listened to the stories and then stood up with the people who were, who were speaking, they were also 
the reason that the world changed. Because when you believe someone's story, when they come to you and they tell you, this happened to me, and you listen, whether or not you think that every part of the story is true or not, when you listen and you acknowledge and you say, well, the world should be better than this, you're part of the force that changes the world. And I keep reading articles and things friends send me that say the same thing in a couple different ways. They say, what has changed since Me Too? Everything and nothing. Or what has changed? Nothing. And it's true, there are so many corners of the world and so many industries where people are still experiencing horrible mistreatment. There is still harassment and assault and discrimination of all sorts, and there always will be. It's an unfortunate part of human nature. And the world still isn't ready for some things that I'm, you know, that are on my mind, that I see a lot. The world isn't ready to discuss some of the anti-Semitism in Silicon Valley. The world isn't ready to discuss the fact that men have also been the victims of abuse at some of these bad companies. Some of my colleagues who experienced the worst bullying and abuse were men. And in the, during the Me Too movement, they felt like they couldn't stand up and share what had happened to them because they didn't want to get in the way of the change that was happening in the world. And I hope that someday the world is ready to talk about those things. But the world changes in very small steps, and what happened in the past two years was an extraordinary leap, and I'll tell you why. Now when I talk to young women <clears throat> who are just beginning their careers as software engineers in Silicon Valley, they know who the bad companies are. They know the names of the bad managers. They know what to do if they're harassed or if they experience discrimination. They know their legal rights. They don't need to be part of whisper networks because the information is finally being brought into the open. The people who need the information the most, they now have access to it. Sexual harassment and discrimination aren't talked about in secret. They are topics that people openly discuss, both in the media, at conferences, on Twitter, in private conversations. I remember how scared we all used to be whenever we would openly say we had experienced or seen legal discrimination, but it's no longer taboo. It's no longer a career-ending step to say I was sexually harassed, to say I was sexually assaulted, to say I was the victim of bullying and abuse. And this is extraordinary. This is power. Now, law-breaking and regulation disruption are no longer attractive features of a tech company. There was a long time when uh, people used to say, I'm the Uber of dog walking, I, we're the Uber of this, when they were trying to raise funding for their companies. Well, they don't say that anymore. Disruption has become a bad word. In some ways, we swung very far the other way, which is typical in times of very quick, and very profound change. It's natural and good and healthy for us to start to question the things that we've taken for granted. It's good for us to push and question every boundary, every norm, every tradition. We wonder if that was wrong, and we didn't see that it was wrong, and we didn't see how broken everything it was, what if all these other things are wrong too. And I think it's important in times of this kind of questioning, which is where we are today, to recognize that this is inevitable and good and healthy. We don't need to throw everything away. Not every norm or tradition will be broken. Not everything that we've taken for granted will end up being wrong or unjust, but it's still healthy to question. And we need to not be afraid and also recognize that not everything might be right. And this brings me to my first lesson that I want to share with you today. Sorry, that was all preface for the real lessons that I'm going to share with you. <laughs> so lesson one, there is far more good in the world than there is bad. At the time I left Uber, I hadn't seen much of a good side of Silicon Valley. I'd seen a whole lot of bad. And I was very, very distrustful of companies, of founders, of tech executives, and the tech industry in general. But what I found in the past two years, which has pleasantly and wonderfully surprised me, and which I've pushed back against quite a few times out of fear, is that the number of bad people, bad companies, and bad things in the world is so much smaller than the number of people, companies, and things that are good. But you wouldn't think this was true. I didn't. Because what we see on Twitter and Facebook in the news today tells a very, very different story. It amplifies and distorts and presents us with the worst, the most egregious, the most surprisingly horrific things that are going on in the world. 
And there are many, many terrible things going on in the world, but they are incredibly rare, despite all appearances. In the past two years, I have been so incredibly fortunate to have seen another side of Silicon Valley and another side of the world. I have been astounded by the outpouring of love and support by people of all backgrounds, races, genders, political views, people all over the world. And not just the people who supported me, but for all the others who stood up and shared their stories, everyone who listened to them in places where it was even more taboo than it was here to discuss these things. I have been so astounded by the kindness that the people in the world have shown me and my fellow whistleblowers. For every single word of hate, there have been a thousand words of love, and I am not exaggerating. I have actually counted. Um, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Fred Rogers, who said that when he was a boy and was scared by things in the news, he said, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, he said, even in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words, and I am always comforted by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in this world. And I used to read these words. I love Fred Rogers. I used to read these words, and I didn't understand what he was talking about. But now I finally see. The worst instincts in our human nature push us to find the differences, to focus on the bad. I think it's a survival mechanism. It's one that keeps us on our toes. It keeps us looking for danger. But we need to overcome that. And we need to look for the good around us every time we are faced with the bad. We need to replace judgment with faith, hate with love, distrust with openness. I'm still learning to do this. It's incredibly hard. It's one of the hardest things I try to do every day. Sometimes I have, to, I have a little detailed daily schedule, and I check off the boxes of everything I do. And one of the things that I put in there, and I, I put in there quite often, is look for the love, don't look for the bad. Because it's so easy to just notice the things that are going wrong in the world. And the next lesson I'm going to tell you about right now is the hardest lesson I have to share with you today, because it's the one that's most likely to be misunderstood. Lesson two, diversity and inclusion programs alone cannot address the most serious problems. Uber checked all the boxes for a company in Silicon Valley that cared about diversity and inclusion on paper. Uber had it all. Uber had women's groups. It sponsored women employees. It sponsored engineering conferences for women. It hired from women's only software engineering boot camps. It hired quite a few of the more vocal and famous diversity and inclusion voices in the industry. It did culture and engagement surveys and tried to act on those surveys. It empowered people to lead the charge on diversity and inclusion issues. It had employee resource groups for every gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. It had unconscious bias training and led some very serious efforts to eliminate bias and discrimination in the recruitment process. It had women on the board. It had women in positions of power throughout the company. This was all true when I was there. And if you looked solely at this you know, what was on paper, you would have thought that it was a wonderful place to work. People there were doing everything that, you know, you're supposed to do to make a company more diverse and inclusive. But none of it mattered and none of it changed anything because Uber systemically harassed, discriminated against, and retaliated against its employees. The issue at the core was that Uber did not need more diversity and inclusion programs because it was like with all this stuff that was going on where people were trying to make it a better place. It had a culture that ignored and violated civil rights and employment laws. And the issue was that Uber needed to stop breaking the law. And what I'm saying here is not that diversity and inclusion don't matter. They do. They matter a whole lot. What I'm saying is that it doesn't matter how many women you have at your company if they are all being sexually harassed. I'm saying that it doesn't matter how many black employees are at your company if you're discriminating against them and retaliating against them for reporting their discrimination. It doesn't matter how many employee resource groups you have if, you're, if those employees are being bullied and harassed and intimidated by their managers. It was like trying to put a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. These things were good, but they, they couldn't even begin to fix the heart of the issue. And the issue was that what was happening behind the scenes is that issues like discrimination and harassment and retaliation, um, they were being painted as a problem that groups of employees were supposed to solve. 
when the reality was that the company and its legal and human resources teams were legally obligated to fix these things. And I've heard people say that these programs will help hire companies hire more women and people of color. But discriminating against people who belong to a protected class because they are a member of that class is already illegal. If you refuse to hire a qualified candidate just because she is a woman, then you've broken the law. And I remember being faced with these issues when I was at Uber and realizing that the company expected the people who were experiencing illegal treatment to solve the problems that led to their own mistreatment. For example, the company was losing women engineers because they weren't being treated fairly, and then the women engineers were told that they needed to go and recruit more women. So, what will solve these issues? The issue is that the existing employment laws, which are very, very powerful, need to be enforced. Harassment, discrimination, and retaliation are all illegal. We need to encourage victims to report illegal treatment that they experience in the workplace to the federal, um, the federal agency that's responsible for enforcing civil rights and employment laws. So they need to go, we need to encourage them to go and report their treatment to the EEOC, the Equal, Oppor the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, who can then enforce existing powerful employment laws. Now the next lesson I want to share with you is a bit different from the last. Lesson three, you do not need to be an activist to change the world. I'm not an activist. I probably never will be. Neither activism nor advocacy are my full-time jobs, or really my jobs at all. One of the scariest things about being a whistleblower, about sharing my story, about telling the world what had happened at Uber, was the possibility that the world would put me into a box, stick a label on me, even though it was a good one, um, and then it would keep me there. And I was a very reluctant whistleblower for that reason. There were so many things that I wanted to do in my life. I was a software engineer. I'd worked in particle physics. I was a writer. And at the time I wrote the blog post, I was the editor in chief of a tech magazine. And now today I'm a staff editor at the New York Times. And those were the things that I wanted people to know me for. I wanted them to know me for my accomplishments, for the things that I cared so much about, the things that I devoted every waking moment to. And I wanted to be able to keep working on those things. I didn't want to have to drop all of my work in my life just because I was speaking up about injustice. I wanted to speak up and share my story, and then I wanted to get back to work. I didn't want to have to redefine myself or change my entire life. I had this long, I have this long list of things. I have this little notebook. I'm a big fan of notebooks and writing things down. I have this little notebook that's titled Goals and Dreams. And it's a notebook that I've been filling in my entire life. And I would look you know, at that in the moments that followed my blog post, and I would say, what if, what if the world puts me in a box and I can never do any of these things? And there are so many others who feel similarly. Some of them who have stood up and wanted the title and have changed their lives and devoted their lives to making change in the world. But there are others who stood up and said, I want to share my story because I, I feel like I should, and I want to take my life back. But then I want to go back to what I was doing. I want to go back to work. I want people to remember me for things other than sexual harassment or sexual assault. And I frequently hear from young women who tell me that they want to change the world so badly, but they don't necessarily feel called to do the kinds of things that other people have done in the past. And I tell them what I'm telling you all today, that you don't need to be an activist to change the world. You can change the world in a thousand different ways, ways that none of us can ever predict. You might discover an algorithm that changes the way we do computation. You might discover the cure for cancer. You might write a book that changes the minds of an entire generation. You might find yourself in a situation where you have to stand up and blow the whistle about illegal treatment. You might mentor someone who will take what you taught them and use it to change the world. And there is a very, very significant chance that you will change the world without ever having known it. Which brings me to the next lesson I want to share with you today. Lesson four, change happens over a lifetime, never in one moment. 
Earlier in this talk, when I brought up my childhood, I did so for a reason. I said that in order to understand change, we need to understand the historical context of that change and everything that led to it. I believe it is undeniable that extraordinary change has happened in the past two years, but that change did not happen in 2017. The work that brought about everything that happened did not happen in one year. It took lifetimes to accomplish the change that we see toward women today, lifetimes. It required the work of thousands upon thousands of men and women in this world, people whose stories I will never know, people whose lives altered the course of history in small ways that paved the way for everyone else, including myself, people who have no idea that they even changed the world. I don't know all of their stories, and I don't know all their names. And I could stand here, and I could say the names of 100 women and as many men who paved the way, but for every single name that I said, there would be a 1,000 names that I did not know who were just as influential. And the way that I've learned to understand this is to look at my own life. Writing the blog post was not something that merely happened on that bright spring Sunday. It was something that was a consequence of every single decision I had ever made in my life. And it was something that was a slow, indirect result of every piece of advice that I'd ever been given, of every story I'd ever been told, of every decision I'd ever made, of every mistake and failure and success. It was the result of many, many years of long, hard, painful work, work on myself. And there were thousands of people whose lives and words informed the long chain of events that led me to Penn, that pushed me out of physics and put me into Silicon Valley that brought me to Uber and eventually brought me to my kitchen table that Sunday and brought me here in front of you all today. It took my entire life to be able to make the decision to write that blog post. And I don't just mean causally, because of course all these events are related, but I can look back at my life and I can point to exact moments in time, exact people, ex specific books, and see how they were critical things that molded me into the person who needed to make that decision on that day. Change does not happen in a moment is not some lightning bolt from the sky. It is not a voice from heaven. It does not happen in a day. And it does not happen in a generation. And you may never, ever know if you have done something that will change the world. But it, it sounds discouraging, but it's not. It's the opposite. And I think often of my father, who passed away when I was a teenager. He, more than anyone else in my life, shaped my, the person I am today and led to the person I was when I made that decision to post the blog post. He was a man of very strong conviction, of unwavering belief in the good of people and in the redemption of the world. He never got to see the way that his work, his life, his words changed the world through me. And there are so many times when I've wanted him to come back, if only for a moment, so that I can say, do you see this? See this bright new world? This would have never happened without you. And I, will, I bet that every one of you sitting here today even though sometimes it might not feel like the things that you say to others matter, that the times that you believe someone when they tell you their story, the times that you stand up and tell your own story, you might not feel like you're doing very much. Sometimes you might not feel like you're doing anything at all. And if you're anything like me, you might sit there and wonder, what can I do to make the world better? What can I do to change things? And you've probably already changed them more than you will ever realize. And now for the final lesson I want to share with you today. Lesson five, the power of a story or words can change the world. Um, as you heard in the introduction, I was at the Webby Awards last year and I had to come up with a five word exception speech, a short phrase that I would say when they handed me my award. And I thought so long and hard about what I was gonna say and how on earth I could even begin to capture everything that happened and to honor all the people who had spoken up before me and after me. And what I came up with, the five words that really said it all were these, words can change the world. It's such a simple lesson. It's something that we all know that we've been told a thousand times. You know, I know I, <laughs> we've all been told, and at least I have, that ideas have power, that stories can change our life, that the pen is mightier than the sword. And I have to admit, I've heard this so many times that it just doesn't sound real, right? It sounds like a tired cliche. It sounds like the kind of things people say when they don't really have any real advice to give you. And if someone had told me when things were at their worst, when I was at my breaking point, when my coworkers were being discriminated against and bullied and pushed to the brink of sanity, 
that I would change the situation by saying some magic words or by writing an essay, I would have honestly like told them where to shove it if somebody had said that to me. And it's so easy to forget that in this concrete, physical, practical, day-to-day -day world that our lives are completely determined by the things that go on in our minds. That the things that really make the difference, the things that inform our judgments about the world and frame our daily experiences are the ideas and opinions that we have. Very abstract, very head in the clouds, impractical, seemingly really not that important ideas. And these ideas come from a lot of places. For me, many of the ideas that shape how I interpret my life came largely from philosophy. I studied philosophy formally when I was a student at Arizona State and later when I was at Penn, but most of my philosophical education was informal and came from years and years of reading the great philosophers in my teenage years and the years I've lived in Silicon Valley. And I mostly read them because I didn't really know what else to read. And when I was young, I thought, well, these people were very important. Their work has survived over thousands of years. They might have something to say, right? Specifically, the work of the philosopher Kant and his system of ethics taught me that I needed to always treat and understand people as ends in themselves, not as means to some end that I might have. The other philosophers who shaped who I became were the Stoics, who taught that you needed to be aware of what you can control in your life and what is beyond your control. And what it came down to for the Stoics was that the only thing you really have any control over is your mind. So you have this responsibility as a thinking, feeling, living, breathing human being to enrich your mind, to work hard to be the best version of yourself, to strive to live a truly good life. And the idea also is that you know what is good. You might not always know what to do in some situation, but you know. You know what is good and what is bad, and you know that sometimes you make mistakes. And the other ideas that shaped who I am and shaped the decisions that I made, including my decision to publish the blog post, came from other books. Books like The Brothers Karamazov, which changed me profoundly and gave me a new language that I could use to describe how I felt about the struggle that I felt I was always fighting. And books like Man's Search for Meaning, about the author's time in concentra concentration camps during the Holocaust. That book was completely life-changing when I read it around the time that I decided to write my blog post about Uber. It gave me a perspective of who I was, very, very deep inside, and it forced me to confront my own character. And this is that old-timey word that no one really uses anymore because it's kind of fallen out of fashion, character. Character, it's who you are at a very deep level with all your ideas and inclinations and your guts and your heart and your soul. It's all those big things that make you the person that you are. And that book made me examine my character because ultimately that's what the book was all about. And the books that I've read in my life, they were everything. They changed everything. They let me live a thousands, of thousands of other lives that I otherwise never would have lived. They let me experience things that I otherwise never would have experienced in my wildest dreams. They let me see and build empathy and walk into other people's lives and learn how so many other people saw the world so differently than I could ever see it. And it helped me to see the world differently too. Because when someone sits down and they take all those big ideas that are in their head, their experiences that are so wonderfully unique to their own time on this earth, when they put them down on paper and they give them into the world, that's when the real magic happens. That's when the seeds are planted. That's when we change the world. And so when my world needed changing, when the world of my coworkers needed to change, when Silicon Valley needed to change, I knew what I had to do. I had to tell my story. And we've seen the effect that that had not only on Uber, not only on Silicon Valley, but the world. And I know it sounds so cheesy because it sounded cheesy to me when I was, when I was younger. When people said, oh, your, your stories can change the world. Your books can change everything. Saying what you've gone through can change everything. It sounded so cheesy when I was there and I was struggling and I was suffering and I was having a really hard time in the world. But it's true. It's really honestly true. And how many times can we say this about things, that if you tell your story, that it will change the world? How many things can we say that about? There are so many things that have the potential to change the world, like political actions or demonstrations and other things along those lines, but they come with caveats, right? You have to do it at the exact right time when the world needs it. The world needs to be completely ready for it. Everything needs to be set. The stage needs to be completely ready, or else it makes no impact. 
But sharing a story is totally different. Yes, there is a time and there is a place for your message, but that time and place might not even be today. It might be 10 years from now. It might be 100 years from now. It might even be 2,000 years from now, as it was in the case with the Stoics. When you put your story out into the world, it has the power to change the present and alter the future in ways you will never, ever begin to know or understand. And this is why, um, after working as a software engineer and working at Stripe, um, I left tech and engineering and physics. I just left, I left it all behind, and I joined the New York Times. And I'm not a reporter. I don't edit reporters. I don't cover breaking news. Um, what I do is I help people tell their stories. I am an editor and occasional writer in the opinion section where I help people take the stories and ideas and experiences and hopes and dreams in their heads and help them bring them to the world. And it's a glorious, wonderful, powerful, humbling thing to do. And you never know, I certainly don't, which story, if any, will change the world. You never know how many people's hearts it will touch, how many people's minds it will change, and that's part of the magic. That's part of the power of the written word. And I want to leave you with something today that I want you to go and do, something that I want you to be. Um, I want to leave you with this request. I want you to be better. I want you to be better than me. I want you to be better than the people who came before you, be better than the people around you, be better than everyone else, be better than you are today. Be the best possible version of yourself, whoever that wonderful, unique person is. Be a person of character. Work hard to build up your character, even when the world may laugh at you or misunderstand you or think that you're cheesy, or even when you might think to yourself, this feels kind of cheesy. It doesn't feel like it has any impact on the real world. Whatever it is that you care about in life, whether it's technology or software or your company or journalism or writing or diversity or politics, whatever it is, bring your whole self to your work every day. Bring your whole self to the world every single day. Live your story, whatever it is, and make it a good one. And you have to live it. Because by living it, by living the things that you believe matter in the world, by living the way that you wish others would live, that's the first step to having a story that really counts for something. It's the only way to change the world. And even more than that, it's really the only way to live. Thank you.